costs. A huge temperature drop in store for the east and northeast tomorrow, but a brief temperature drop. Temperatures will rebound in the long range. I'll have your full forecast coming up. We begin with breaking news. Police say a 16-year-old boy has drowned after an incident in Flat Rock. Yes, late this afternoon, emergency responders went to the swimming hole off Wind Gap Road. They rushed the teenager to hospital, but he didn't make it. We will have a live report from Flat Rock coming up later in the program. Now on to other news tonight. The province's police force has a new chief. The Royal Newfoundland Constabulary is now being led by Joe Boland. The 34-year veteran takes over at a time when the force is trying to regain the public's trust following the shooting death of Don Dumphy and a highly publicized sexual assault case. But as here now's Jeremy Eaton reports, Chief Boland says he's up for the task. Any doubt about who would get the top cop job ended as soon as Joe Boland arrived at this morning's press conference with Justice Minister Andrew Parsons. I recognize there have been issues, but it is now time to change course and to rebuild trust. And as such, I'm extremely pleased today to announce the RNC's new Chief of Police, Joe Boland. Person says there was interest in the job from as far away as Russia. But in the end, it went to a man from Logie Bay who began his career in 1983. Boland's appeal for government, he's worked in just about every division at the RNC, and he's well liked by his fellow officers as a former president of the police association. Now, he just has to convince the public that he's the man for the job after a string of incidents involving RNC members. The death of Don Dunphy, Constable Joe Smythe shot and killed him on Easter Sunday 2015. The sexual assault case involving Constable Doug Snellgrove, that's being appealed by the Crown. Harassing phone calls, Cornerbrook Constable Sean Kelly is appealing his 2015 conviction of those. With regards to, you know, the Dunphy inquiry, it was a tragedy. And, uh, you know, we sympathize with Megan Dunphy, her family, friends in the community, and also some of our officers that were involved. And I think what you saw in that report, or in, that, in the inquiry, was that it was very thorough, it was very fair, and it was very transparent. I really think that uh, I'm up to that challenge, and I think this organization is up to that challenge. After taking questions, Chief Boland received a warm welcome from his officers and staff. Your ideas, your concerns, it all matters to me. You're going to have a lot of say in how the RNC moves forward and the look at the RNC. Uh, the people in Newfoundland deserve the best police service, and we're going to show them together. We're going to show them just what the RNC is made of. Jeremy Eaton, CBC News, St. John's. At this morning's press conference, Chief Boland was asked about the Courtney Lake investigation. The 24-year-old woman hasn't been seen since June 7th, and police are treating her disappearance as a homicide. This case is on the go right now. It's the Courtney Lake case. Obviously, you're jumping into the new job facing that. Is there any update on that, or do you have any, how you, or any idea how you will approach this particular case? I, I don't have an update. I don't know if Jeff could probably yeah, give, it, give yeah, an update. Yeah. Uh, I've been busy the last couple hours or so <laughs> to prepare for an interview. But, yeah, you'll hear something shortly from me. Meanwhile, Lake's ex-boyfriend had his court appearance set over this morning until July 11th. Philip Stephen Smith was to face charges including driving while disqualified and breaking court orders. Court documents show the 25-year-old pleaded guilty to a number of offenses on June 7th, the same day Lake disappeared. One of those was an April 15th assault against Lake for which he received a suspended sentence. Yesterday, as part of the homicide investigation, into Lake's disappearance. Police scoured Torbayman's pond off the highway just outside St. John's. Nearly three months ago, the former Belvedere Orphanage was gutted by fire. Now, just the shell of the building remains standing. Tonight on CBC Investigates, we take a look at what comes next for the heritage site. It's a story that includes new details about money trouble for the numbered company that owns the property and complaints about safety issues there before the fire broke out. Rob Antle has the details. This dramatic scene back in April. 
a heritage structure, one of the oldest in St. John's, dating back to the 1800s. This is what's left today. The city will demolish it for safety reasons, with taxpayers footing the bill, at least for now. If and when there's a, there's a bankruptcy proceeding, uh, then I'm told the city will be high on the, uh, on the possibility level of getting the money back that we've actually put into the property to secure it and have it demolished. The city has tried contacting the property's owner but hasn't heard back. Now CBC News has uncovered new details on recent financial troubles facing that numbered company linked to developer Craig Williams. Five other businesses in his future group of companies recently went bankrupt, and the numbered company that owns the Belvedere land is not in great shape either. According to recent court testimony, it had just $59 in the bank, while owing $3 million in mortgages and other debts, and was also behind on insurance payments. That leaves questions about whether there was coverage on the building at the time of the blaze, questions that are unanswered, at least for now. Also unanswered is the cause of the fire. The RNC has wrapped up its investigation and says it remains unknown. But what is known is that there were concerns about safety here, concerns about trespassers and vandals, and the risk of fire. The RNC responded to at least a half dozen calls of suspicious activity in the three months before the blaze. And according to documents obtained through access to information, the city received repeated complaints from nearby residents, at least another half dozen over a year and a half. Some of those warned about the building being a fire hazard. For us, uh, safety is, is uh, extremely important, and that's why we go in immediately and make sure the property is secure. I guess the ultimate responsibility would lie with the property owner. The owner was also aware of issues, saying this at a court hearing in March about the company's finances. It doesn't have any employees. It's currently not doing any business other than making sure that vandals don't destroy the building. It's not clear what the company did to address that problem. To date, the city has spent seven grand to secure the property, boarding up windows and doors in the month before the fire, putting up this fence afterwards to keep people out. Those costs will soon go up when a tender is called to demolish the building and tear down another piece of the city's heritage. Rob Antle, CBC News, St. John's. There's going to be an independent review of the rising cost of automobile insurance in this province. Government says it's responding to complaints from drivers. Insurance rates and the cost of claims have continued to rise since the last review, more than a decade ago. The Public Utilities Board and Service NL will be involved in the review. A construction worker fell 24 meters, or about six floors, in St. John's this morning. The man was injured just before noon. He fell from a scaffold at the site of the Sandman Hotel construction project on Kenmount Road. He's in his early 30s and from Flat Rock, and he was conscious, conscious rather, when taken to hospital. Some workers were on the site this afternoon doing ground level and interior work. Occupational Health and Safety is investigating parking spaces for cancer patients. That was the demand from protesters today at the Health Sciences Center in St. John's. And after a two year fight, it appears some progress has been made. Here now is Allison Sampson reports. About 16 protesters gathered on the parking spots they hope to reserve. They want to designate them for cancer patients going through chemo. Jeff Blackwood has traveled this path a lot in the past couple decades. He lost his first wife to cancer 20 years ago. Andy lost his second wife just in the past two years. Not everybody who's got cancer, but those who are going through chemo. Uh, your day is long. You come in sometimes, I know because I was attached at the hip with both my wives, and chemo would start at 8 in the morning, and there were times we didn't get out of here till 4 or 5 in the afternoon. Blackwood says they've come a long way from metered parking and tickets years ago, but there's a lot more they could do. There's about 35 beds dedicated to cancer patients in the Health Science Center. So you got about 35, 36 people who are going through chemo on a fairly regular basis. And the end result is that if we could get even 20 spots that were designated, that would be a major help, particularly near the front of the lot so they don't have to walk a great distance. Because you imagine what it's like in the winter, as I say, that's, that's even worse. Eastern Health listened to the concerns of the protesters. And this afternoon, the CEO, David Diamond, said they'll be adding eight more disabled parking spots within weeks.
disabled parking, what we've done is we've allowed clinicians in the cancer program to, if they have a patient who has mobility issues while they're taking chemo or other treatments, uh, they can provide uh, authorization so that cancer patients can park in the blue spaces. Diamond also said that about a dozen more spaces will be added before winter, once a new parking lot is constructed. Even with these extra spaces, chemo patients still won't be guaranteed a spot. Allison Sampson, CBC News, St. John's. Back now to one of our top stories. A teenage boy is dead after an incident at a swimming hole in Flat Rock. Here now is Arianna Kelland is live in the Northeast Avalon community. So Arianna, oh, and I'm just being told everybody that Arianna isn't able to join us just at this moment. So hopefully we will get to her uh, in just a little bit. Stay with us. Well, tonight we are beginning our cod comeback series. For the first time in a generation, a return to a commercial cod fishery could be on the horizon. But a lot has changed since the moratorium put the province out of the cod business. Now many say if we get a second chance at cod, we'll need to change too. Here and now, Zach Gowdy has our story. Morning in the sea, a new day of fishing on the horizon. Slow, slow. Brad Watkins and the crew of the Newfoundland Mariner got in last night to unload a catch of crab. A disappointing haul, but what Watkins really wants to fish is cod with his new hook and line system. This uh, boat was going to be rigged with uh, 20,000 hooks. We can shoot them in two hours, low labor intensive uh, compared to gill nets and what have you, and the quality is, is top notch. The system was intended for his old boat, the Atlantic Charger. But in 2015, while Watkins was ashore buying the gear, his crew had a catastrophe at sea. They survived, but the Atlantic Charger was lost. Watkins' insurance paid out big. He could have taken the cash and walked away from the fishery for good. Instead, he bought back in. So it was unfinished business for me. It's like the gear that I'm going to be putting on. There's boats still in crates, a lot of money, a lot of investing, and a lot of deals done. And Mother Nature uh, put me on hold and uh, I just felt like I had to uh, get back at it and finish off what I started. Now, the province's cod fishery may also be getting a second chance. Cod stocks are at their highest levels since the moratorium began 25 years ago. It's still a long way from a commercial fishery, but Watkins says if cod does come back, we need a new way to catch it. Uh, there's not so many fish in the ocean, so we got to capitalize and try to get the dollar value out of the fish. It's a feeling shared by fishermen and policy experts alike. We can't go back to the old days uh, where we took a, let's say we took a filet mignon from the ocean and turned it into hamburger meat, you know, the block market or the, or the, uh, or the mince market, right? Uh, again, that served a purpose in the day. That model is not going to work today. While this province has been out of the cod business, two neighboring countries have risen up in the global market, Norway and Iceland. Norway is the reigning king of cod, producing nearly a million metric tons per year. With that volume, Norway has cornered the market for cheap processed cod, the market Newfoundland and Labrador used to compete in. But if we can't beat Norway on price, Many say we should follow Iceland instead and aim for quality. They harvest at the right time of the year. They're bleeding and gutting on board their vessels, whether it's a small inshore boat or a large factory vessel. With just 200,000 tons of cod per year, Iceland has oriented its fishery to produce a high quality product that sells for a much higher price. But that's not all. By investing in technology, Iceland is finding uses for every part of the fish. They have a strategy right now in Iceland over the next five years to get more value from the traditional waste stream than from the fillet. That's the kind of model we need to look at in terms of full utilization, maximizing value per kilo of catch. That's really the terminology that, that's key in this discussion. But Watkins says there's another urgent discussion that needs to happen around the fishery. It's too political. Uh, our fishery is too political. The other countries that are successful, uh, Iceland, Norway, they, they, they're not socialism. Uh, they don't have that social aspect in their fishery. And uh, 
the politics is taken out of it. They're run as businesses, not as, as a political way to get uh, elected or votes or, or to get people just to stay in the outports and use EI as a subsidy. It's a sea change from the cod fishery of the past. Can it work? Brad Watkins believes it can, and he has a lot riding on it. I've always had a passion that we can be more. We just need to pull together to be able to do it, to make it a proud uh, industry in the, in the province. Zach Gowdy, CBC News, St. John's. And our COD Comeback Series continues tomorrow when we'll focus on automation in the fishery. Local engineers are building robots that could one day process crab faster than humans, but will they also cut humans out of a job? That's tomorrow on Here and Now. Okay, so back now to the drowning in Flat Rock. A teenage boy is dead after an incident at a swimming hole in the community. Here in now's Ariana Kelland is live in the Northeast Avalon community right now. So Ariana, what can you tell us about what happened this afternoon? Well, Carolyn, we know that the Torbay Volunteer Fire Department, St. John's Fire Department, police and paramedics were called here around 3.30 today about a possible drowning. Now, a 16-year-old boy was taken from the water and rushed to hospital, but we now know that he has since died and his family has been notified. Now, what you're looking at right here is Big River in Flat Rock, just off Wine Gap Road. It leads right to the ocean, and a little ways down from here is a swimming hole called a Bark Pot Swimming Hole. It's super popular for swimmers and we've actually unfortunately heard of drownings and near drownings in this area before and uh, it didn't stop some swimmers though as we were on the way here we actually passed swimmers who were coming to this swimming hole despite what had just happened but uh, as for right now Carolyn we have no further details on what happened to that 16 year old boy only that there was a drowning incident he was taken to hospital but it was too late reporting live for here and now in Flat Rock I'm Mariana Kelland. Up next, we'll talk about new rules for businesses that sell flavored e-cigarettes.
Welcome back, everyone. And everyone was talking about the great day we had oh, today. Lovely. Yeah. Nice day today. Um, nice day Thursday. <laughs> There's like this brief kind of... Uh, 24 lull. hours in between. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, where uh, tomorrow is going to be, uh, really, uh, it's a big, deep pothole, but it's a short... We just have to get through tomorrow. And then again, Thursday. <laughs> we can do it. We can do it. Yes. Uh, yes. And uh, so uh, not all the world will not end, but it is going to be chilly tomorrow. 10 degrees. Wow. Uh, so uh, kind of more like what we were dealing with on the Canada Day weekend. Right. Mm -hmm. um, welcome back, by the way. <laughs> uh, now, as we take a look at uh, highs today, yeah, Terra Nova, 24 degrees, Gander, 20 degrees, Badger, 21, Bonavista, 22, St. John's, 24. Look at the temperatures right now as we move to the currents, 9 degrees in Gander and 10 in Bonavista. So just a huge temperature drop, and that's the front that is knock, knock, knocking on the door of the Avalon right now. 23 still in St. John's, but uh, over the next few hours, that front is going to be racing through. It is over the Bonavista Peninsula right now. Again, along that front, we are watching uh, not just a temperature drop, but some showers that have been rolling into central parts of Newfoundland for today. Uh, not seeing any lightning strikes, but uh, certainly not out of the question over the next little bit. And you can see where that front has been clearing out of central parts of Newfoundland. It is now over northeastern parts of the island. What we can do here is actually show you where the winds are starting to take that drop. And you can see where the winds have now shifted to northerly for Gander out towards Bonavista, but are still southerly over Trinity Bay and towards uh, Clarenville. But uh, that won't be the case for too much longer. Now into Labrador, you can see where uh, a bit of clouds have uh, fired up for today. Risk of a shower or thunderstorm in the next little bit for Labrador City over towards Churchill Falls. Looks like most of the action will be south of Happy Valley Goose Bay with some of that uh, uh, convection there. Uh, certainly the risk over the next few hours that Happy Valley Goose Bay gets into the mix as well, uh, but it's a slight risk. Now as we work towards tomorrow morning, it's a very quiet start across the Big Land. The island, it's a bright start for the western half up towards the northern peninsula, but note that cloud cover. There's going to be a chance of some drizzle along the northeast coast uh, with that, uh, that cloud cover as well. 5 to 7 degrees from St. John's up to Bonavista Bay into Gander. Uh, also a risk of some drizzle to start the day along the Buren Peninsula. The west, as I mentioned, and Labrador, a nice start to the day. Now as we roll throughout the day, an area of high pressure moving in uh, will slowly but surely be clearing those clouds out down the northeast coast. I think St. John's into the mix around this time tomorrow. We'll start to really see things brighten up and it won't be a bad evening. You're just going to want to bundle up. Now, uh, I think it, as we roll throughout the day tomorrow, uh, just 10 degrees is all we're going to muster in terms of temperatures with that north northeast wind uh, sustained in that 10 to 15 kilometer per hour range. So the wind isn't going to be really punching in, but it will have a bite. And for tomorrow evening around uh, the uh, supper time into the sunset time around nine o'clock tomorrow evening, just seven degrees. By the way, tomorrow will be the last day of a sunset at 9 p.m. By the time we get to Thursday, the sunset will be 8.59 and so on. Just a little tidbit for you there. North-northeast winds, uh, at ten, again, keeping temps at 10 degrees from the southern shore all the way up into Bonavista Bay. Twillingate should get to around 12. And note, Clarenville 13-14 should get to 18 or 19 for central tomorrow. Brighter and warmer away from that north-northeast wind. And I think at Port Basque in the 18-degree range tomorrow, uh, likely in the 20-degree range from the Codroy, Codroy Valley up into uh, the Saint Bay St. George area. And a beautiful day in Labrador, but again, showers and a risk of thunderstorms firing up into the afternoon. Churchill Falls to McCovic, Cartwright, and down towards Mary's Harbor. The good news is it is a one-day blip. We're recovering quite nicely temperature-wise over the next three. We're going to dive deeper into these details through long range a little bit later in the program. Thanks, Ryan. Well, changes to prevent and reduce smoking came into effect over the weekend. Here and now's Reagan Burden has that story. Pay no attention to the e-cigarettes behind the curtain. On Saturday, the provincial government made changes to tobacco legislation and anti-smoking advocates are thrilled. Uh, the flavor ban is fantastic. And then of course the e-cigarette, uh, the vaping products uh, out of sight not sold to minors, not used in public places. Uh, the same rules apply that currently apply to tobacco. So it's great news. Also gone, the province's only hookah lounge. Shisha smoking indoors is now illegal. Cody says that these changes will prevent more young people from picking up smoking. 
We know that the, uh, the flavors attract new smokers. We know that the electronic cigarettes are popular with young people. We know that electronic cigarettes often, use of electronic cigarettes often leads to regular smoking. So there's a definite connection. Cody does recognize that e-cigarettes can help people quit smoking, and that's exactly what Jackie Moore says her business is there to do. My business um, is to help people quit smoking, um, give them a healthier alternative. When the CBC first reached out to Moore about the changes she'd have to make to her store, she didn't know what they were. I did reach out when I got the letter because I don't understand the way they word things. I, you know, I'm, I'm being honest, I don't. I read it and I'm reading it over and over trying to comprehend it. Um, I, I found it very difficult to understand what they were saying. So I, I called and left messages, but nobody got back to me until today. 24 hours before Moore had to have the changes completed, she got the answer she was looking for. Uh, my windows, all the windows in the store have to be darkened out. Um, nobody can see in from the outside, so I need to get them um, tinted or, he said, put temporary curtains up. The purpose of these changes? Reduce the appeal of smoking to youth and lower the number of smokers in a province where just over one in five people smoke. Reagan Burden, CBC News, St. John's. Royal Newfoundland Constabulary has a brand new chief of police. We'll tell you who it is coming up.
Welcome back to Here and Now. The chief medical examiner for the province says a man stabbed at a party in St. John's would have died if he didn't get swift medical attention. That was revealed today, the sentencing hearing for Robert Mills. Mills assaulted the man with brass knuckles. Here and Now's Glenn Payette reports, but first a caution, some of the pictures in Glenn's report are graphic. This was the scene of Bedlam at a house on Mahogany Place in St. John's in March of 2016. When it was over, this man had been stabbed seven times. One wound to his chest so severe, a lung collapsed and he lost three liters of blood. The province's chief medical examiner said the man would have died if he hadn't gotten immediate medical attention. 24-year-old Robert Mills has pleaded guilty for his role in the assault. He didn't stab the man, but attacked him with a pair of brass knuckles. Mills admitted he hit the man in the head, landing 10 to 12 blows. The man had been trying to get Mills and others to leave the party. It was supposed to be a party for a few young friends, but word of it spread on social media and others began inviting themselves. Drinking and drugs helped fuel the aggression. Mills says he threw away the brass knuckles. They were never found. The knife was discovered on a neighbor's lawn. It had the victim's DNA on it. The victim's blood is also on this chair. Four male youths are also being tried for the attack. In a victim impact statement, the victim's mother said her home no longer feels like a safe place and that she sometimes lies on the floor and cries. And she says she's angry because her son is ashamed to take off his shirt because of the scars. Mill's sentencing hearing continues tomorrow. Glenn Payette, CBC News, St. John's. How long is Wanda Ash going to spend in prison for her role in the 2013 death of Jason Skinner in Grand Falls, Windsor? Well, the Crown wants six and a half years. The defense wants four. Ash appeared in court in Grand Falls, Windsor this morning. She was convicted in the death of Skinner four years ago. She was not the woman who stabbed Skinner to death, but the Crown argues she still played an important role in the failed robbery, which led to Skinner's death. Ash is expected back in court later this month for sentencing. Back now to one of our top stories tonight. The Royal Newfoundland Constabulary has a new chief. Joe Boland takes over at the helm. A 34-year veteran of the, of the uh, force who came up through the ranks. The RNC has faced some difficult times recently. And here is how Chief Boland responded when asked what he'll do differently. I will build a team. We have an opportunity here now to build a new executive team. There are many... Uh, there are many open openings within senior management, so that'll be the first part. The other part will be, look, we have great people in this organization. Some of the best people that I've ever had an opportunity to work for, you know, and the community needs to learn who those people are and what they bring to this community. And the other part are the community uh, stakeholders that we deal with. Uh, you know, the, the, the safety and security of our community is all our responsibility. And in some cases, the RNC will lead that charge, and in other cases, we'll support those uh, those community groups, organizations, or individuals. What about some of the recommendations that came, that came out of the Dunphy inquiry? A lot of that had to do with the trust in the force. Is that one of your top priorities to, to restore that trust? Yeah, certainly it is. And uh, you know, first of all, I think you know I'm I'm very fortunate to be named chief today. But I think there's a lot of people in this organization that believe that I have the skill sets that can lead the organization in the right path. Uh, you know, with regards to, you know, the Dunphy inquiry, it was a tragedy. And, uh, you know, we sympathize with Megan Dunphy, her family, friends, and the community, and also some of our officers that were involved. And, uh, you know, I'm, I, I can honestly say that, you know, Minister Parsons, by selecting uh, Justice Barry, it was, I think it was a brilliant move to select Justice Barry. He certainly has a lot of respect. I have a lot of respect for him. And I think what you saw in that report or in that in the inquiry was that it was very thorough, it was very fair, and it was very transparent. So I, I think, you know, going forward, yeah, there's a lot of work to do, Fred, but I really think that uh, I'm up to that challenge, and I think this organization is up to that challenge. Chief Bowen, you said that you've been with the RNC for more than 30 years. Why would you want to take on this job when you could probably just retire and relax? <laughs> now, now, that's probably... <laughs> with all the challenges that Fred's laid out and uh, everything yeah. else going on. Well, again, I, I think if you go back to, you know, and, and I guess the people get to know me a little bit more, Jeremy, as we go forward. But I have a deep love for this province and for this organization. I have two children. 
uh, that also love this province and I want to see the future that is bright for them. Uh, the minister and I briefly spoke this morning and uh, I, I don't see any reason why we can't raise our, our game out here a bit as a, as a police service and provide this community with the, uh, with the level of uh, policing that they've come to expect. Biggest challenge facing policing these days, drugs? I think yeah, mental health and addictions and, and drugs certainly. And uh, you know we've come a long way. Uh, just just to share with you, uh, it was announced last week by the Minister of Health that you know the new response for that you will see coming out. You know four plainclothes police officers will now join the mental health uh, crisis team, and so that's a shift. And I can tell you, Fred, that in 34 years in, in, for me in policing. That was one of the biggest concerns I had. We were doing it wrong, quite frankly. And in some cases, it's a case where police are being relied on because other departments not necessarily got the resources to be able to handle it. So this new response that we're going to do, we're going to be, we're going to be treating mental health like it should be treated, and that's as a health issue, not a policing issue. And we're going to come to the table, like I said earlier, uh, in some cases we lead, but in this particular case, we should support. Close to 2,000 people from around the globe are in Alberta for the World Indigenous Nations Games. We'll tell you all about it in a few minutes. Imagine doubling your base salary by working overtime. The Sunshine List shows a lot of people who work on provincial ferries are doing just that and earning more than $100,000 a year. Here now is Peter Cowan speaks with Transportation Minister Al Hawkins about why that's happening. When you look at the overtime bills in your department and you look, for example, there's a cook, base salary $52,000, making over $100,000 once you include overtime, a first mate, who's making more than $200,000 once you include overtime. How concerned are you about these overtime bills? Well, well Peter, uh, part of the, uh, I mean, there are a number of factors that's involved in the overtime uh, aspect for marine services. And of course, we're regulated by Transport Canada and you know we have minimum requirements when it comes to uh, crew members. And so that's like if someone is off sick on a particular day, it's just not a matter of saying, oh, okay, we don't have to worry about having someone uh, fill in for you. We, we do have to bring somebody in because of minimum requirements. 
Of course, there are other issues too. We always have, uh, you know, uh, emergency calls uh, that happen outside of the normal working hours. That that certainly would uh, add to that. And, and of course, uh, compounding some of these issues have been uh, the problems we've had with the the veteran and now the Legionnaire and some of the other ferries that we've had to bring in enhanced uh, crews and, and scheduling. So all of that adds to the uh, to the overtime hours and. And, and there are even some other factors in addition to that that, that certainly does cause uh, overtime. And, you know, obviously, uh, you know, that's, that's uh, I guess, working within a collective agreement that we have as well. Uh, there are some w working within the parameters of that. There are some issues there. So th there's a combination of issues that are uh, causing some concern when it comes to overtime for our department. But when you have people who are more than doubling their salary with overtime, wouldn't it be cheaper to just say, let's hire a second person, and then we're paying them both at straight time? Well, not necessarily, because again, like I said, we, you know, we, when we look at minimum requirements, uh, with uh, we, you know, if we're replacing a full, complete crew, and then obviously, you know, that that's a concern that having a full crew come on and may not necessarily have the number of hours that that would uh, certainly be uh, worthwhile for them to uh, to have employment. What ways are there in order to reduce that overtime cost? Well, I, I think one of one of the uh, ways that, uh, or one of the, the factors that would help us is to have a reliable service that's operating and, and vessels that are operating. And even with the newer vessels, you know the challenges that I've had, and, and I have certainly been very, very frustrated with uh, dealing with those, uh, with those two ferries. Uh, and, and some of the problems that have been coming with that. What do you say to members of the public who look at that and say, you know, my tax dollars are paying more than $100,000 a year for a cook or more than $200,000 a year for a first mate. Yeah, and, um, you know, our taxpayers are paying for $84 million to uh, cover our ferry uh, services to, uh, uh, you know, the communities that we service and uh, at, to a tune of about 93%. And so, again, uh, as a minister, as, as my responsibility, my responsibility is to look at and, uh, ways in which we can be more efficient in providing the services. We have to look at better ways in which uh, we can work within uh, the services that we're providing to make sure that you know, people that are living on these islands, they expect a level of service and, and they deserve a level of service. Uh, but we have to work within, uh, within I guess, the fiscal uh, constraints that, some, that we have uh, to be able to provide an adequate service and, and in, again, have a return for the taxpayers. And so, you know, it's, it's, um, yeah, it's a pretty of a challenging time and a difficult balance to have uh, to make sure all of that's, uh, that's uh, taken care of. And again, again, it'd be my responsibility to see how we can improve the services and be more efficient in doing, uh, in providing those services. Well, thank you very much for your time. It's my pleasure. Well, the World Indigenous Nations Games are now underway in Alberta, about one hour south of Edmonton. Up to 2,000 athletes are expected to participate in both traditional and non-traditional events. They represent at least 29 nations, including Ethiopia, Finland and Brazil. Roberta Bell has the details. Bringing the World Indigenous Games to life here in Masquachis has been a long time dream for the community and they've pulled it off with a lot of hard work and help from neighboring nations. But celebrating who they are on the powwow grounds with other Indigenous peoples here in Ermanskin has ignited a fierce pride. We had a lot of the young girls, little teenagers getting ready in the command center and they're putting paint on their faces and that's that's a identification issue, a, an identification action you know, of who they are as Indigenous girls. And it was just empowering to watch all that happen. Indigenous Affairs Minister Carolyn Bennett was on hand to officially open the Games when she spoke about the spirit of reconciliation. It is really important as we get through to the next 150 years that this is an excellent way to start. As we, as Grand Chief Little Child says, this is reconciliation. You know, it's not only the beauty of the land, but it is the people and the warmth and the hospitality of of Canadians and particularly here at Ermiskin. It's a hopeful sentiment that local leaders want to impart on the next generation. And our hope is that they would want to travel to their communities. So that kind of uh, uh, visiting and visiting other cultures, it enriches your own. It, it, you know, you become happy of your own people and, and the struggles that we've gone through, the storms that we've gone through, and yet we're still here with our identity intact and learning about modern society. The games run all week highlighting traditions that bring indigenous peoples together. Archery, log races, foot races, tug of strength, and some events that may be more familiar like basketball, soccer, and lacrosse. Roberta Bell, CBC News, Masquachis. The weather update is brought to you by Belltone Hearing Service St. John's. Helping the world hear better. <laughs> Thank you. 
All right, so it's going to be chilly tomorrow, but it's coming back. That's so right. no need to panic. It's That's just right. going to be brief. Yeah, absolutely. You don't need to cover those plants up for too long. <laughs> uh, you'll be going out there and uh, giving your plants a pep talk, uh, Stokesy. Uh, <laughs> no, uh, no frost either, which is good. Uh, but uh, yeah, how about this? Ochre Pit Cove on mm -hmm. the northern part of uh, Conception Bay North is uh, down to around 12 degrees yet just down the road in Carbonier it's still 23 so oh, but the, the line front, yeah <laughs> exactly that front is working its way southward St. John's uh, tick 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 uh, an hour or two is about all we're going to muster here and then that temperature is going to drop right off in St. John's as well there's the front on the future tracker that I've drawn on there and you can see where that front will move off and we'll see that uh, northerly wind punch in through tonight into tomorrow morning with some drizzle along that east and northeast coast and across the Avalon that wraps up into the afternoon with clouds slowly but surely uh, mixing out and we'll see a little bit more on the way of some sunshine. A weak disturbance rolling through Labrador will spark up some showers and a risk of a thunderstorm tomorrow from McCovic to Cartwright to Happy Valley Goose Bay as I mentioned earlier. It's a pretty nice day uh, from the west to the north parts of Labrador and a the best forecast for tomorrow will indeed be along the west coast of the island and along that south coast. High teens, low 20s and tons of sunshine there. So Thursday, again, that northerly wind will be on its way out. The southerly wind returns and Thursday is looking like a dynamite day across the island. Really, really nice. Temperatures into the mid 20s, a mix of sun and cloud. Nice in terms of uh, not a lot of humidity building in and we are going to be seeing uh, again a few showers rolling into eastern parts of Labrador. It's Lab West that'll be the damp forecast with that next system moving in and a good chance of showers there. We'll see some better uh, shower chances moving into Labrador East for and Happy Valley Goose Bay for Friday. Happy Valley Goose Bay, the Straits. A slight risk for uh, uh, western parts of the island as well, and I do think the clouds will thicken up a little bit more uh, for central and east, more so than what that model was showing you just a moment ago. Temperatures, I think, still in that 22 to 23 degree range and a little bit cooler in those onshore winds. And again, that, that to chance of showers in western parts of Newfoundland will be a late day risk. Now, as we roll towards the weekend, uh, certainly a lot on the map here, and the green is obviously not good in terms of that's your precipitation and your rain chances. And so with this first wave moving in for Friday night into Saturday, I think we definitely have a pretty good chance of seeing some showers from most of the island early Saturday. Bit of a break into the later parts of the day. I think Sunday is more of a scattered risk, and I think a better chance that we'll see some sunshine in the mix on Sunday, particularly for central parts of Newfoundland. The, the risk is of showers continues uh, for eastern parts of Newfoundland Sunday. But as I mentioned, a better chance of seeing some sun between the clouds uh, for Sunday as opposed to Saturday, which I think all, all in all is, uh, is the cloudier, damper day of the two. Temperatures, though, staying warm, and that's the good news there. And you can see that trend does continue into next week as well. It's always the Monday is the best looking day, right? Uh, and uh, certainly that'll be the case uh, for Saturday, Sunday, Monday, at least at this point. We'll keep you posted over the next couple of days. And for eastern and western parts of Labrador, you can see those shower chances uh, definitely Friday into Saturday, but a, a better looking forecast for Sunday and into Monday, especially in the east. It's time now to introduce our young athlete of the day. Uh, Cameron McDonald from Grand Falls, Windsor is eight years old. Cameron recently earned his red belt in Taekwondo. Great work, Cameron. You're today's Young Athlete of the Day. I've started new jobs before, but I've never ever in my life received this kind of a welcome on day one. A ceremony was held today at the Canadian Space Agency to welcome two new astronauts to the country's space program. The Prime Minister officially named Jennifer Seide and Joshua Kutrick. On Canada Day, the two will be moving to Houston, Texas for two years of training.
back once again. An investigation into why six North American right whales were found dead last month in the Gulf of St. Lawrence has produced some initial results. It appears two of the whales suffered blunt force trauma and the third was injured. That information was from whale necropsies performed last week in Norway. Nicole Williams reports. This is no easy task, but scientists and researchers have been moving lightning fast, desperately trying to figure out what killed six North Atlantic right whales since June as quickly as possible. They conducted three necropsies in three days on the shores of Norway, completing the final one on Saturday. Over the past few days, wildlife pathologists at the Atlantic Veterinary College have been examining samples gathered from the necropsies, and now they're just beginning to glean some answers. We have suspicion indeed that uh, two of these animals had suffered a blunt trauma. And uh, again, being very careful in my terminology, the third animal, we know that it was entangled in fishing gears. Dao says that they've found blood clots in the tissue samples, an injury that could have been caused by ship strikes. But he also says the evidence doesn't necessarily mean those are concrete answers on how the whales died. And they're not ruling out any underlying problems that may have been there before they suffered any trauma. In fact, coming to any conclusions at all has been difficult for the team because of how long the whales were left decomposing in the water before being towed to shore. After a few days, they are pressure cooker, those uh, carcasses, they heat up a lot inside and they, they destroy a lot of the evidence. But Dao says if these whales did die because of ship strikes, a way to better protect them would be to change the routes and speed in which boats pass through the Gulf of St. Lawrence. Pathologists and microbiologists at the ABC are now in talks with the Department of Fisheries and Oceans to discuss what comes next. They haven't yet confirmed whether they'll be towing the remaining three right whale bodies to shore to conduct further necropsies, but they do say that a full report is expected in the next six to eight weeks. Nicole Williams, CBC News, Charlottetown. Well, Minister of Transport Mark Arnault has outlined plans for more than $2 billion in infrastructure spending. I dream of a totally integrated and modern transportation system in which all modes of transport can talk to each other and coordinate their activities. The money is going to refurbish trade corridors that are operating at capacity and in need of expansion. Marine ports, railways, airports and border crossings will all be revamped. The cash is part of a $10 billion that the federal government plans to spend over the next decade on trade and transport projects. A dramatic animal rescue to tell you about now. This video is from U.S. Forest Services. It shows firefighters in Arizona carrying two fawns away from a raging wildfire. Oh. Only young deer are recovering at a wildlife rehab facility. And the Forest Service posted today that, quote, Smokey the Bear would be very, very happy.
Welcome back once again. For weeks, we have been showing you the ways Canadians have been marking Canada's 150, but Ellie Gotts might have us beat. Over the holiday weekend, the 89-year-old jumped 3,500 meters during his first time skydiving. I thought I want to do something that I've never done before. And then came the Canada event. 150 years Canada. I thought I'm going to be a patriot and we jumped. <laughs> he looks fantastic. Ellie is a Holocaust survivor who says he's loved planes and flying all his life. He jumped with a friend who's 60. Together their ages almost make 150. He says the experience was beautiful and he was only worried about losing <laughs> his teeth. <laughs> Well, here's another feat. Completing one triathlon is hard enough, but what about running 31 in a row? Well, Edmonton's Malcolm Stinson is doing one triathlon a day for the month of July, but it's not just for fun. Stinson is a cancer survivor raising money for research. To date, I think we've raised around $10,000 in two days. Wow, that's a two kilometer swim, a 90K bike ride, and a 21 kilometer run. Stinson actually credits his cancer diagnosis for pushing him to get better at cycling and says his message to other people with cancer is don't let anything stop you. Well, just enough time to show you our beautiful viewer picture of the day and icebergs galore right now. Wow. Uh, and this is another beauty shot. Now, I'm guessing those are two separate bergs, mm -hmm. even how Looks close like they are together just because of the difference in uh, colors. Mm -hmm. uh, but this one was taken in the Twillingate region, and that is thanks to Pamela Brown Hobbs for sending that one in on my Facebook page. Okay, I can see the tourists flocking there after watching <laughs> our show tonight. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> thanks very much to Pamela. Thanks very much to all of you for joining us. Have a great night, and we'll see you tomorrow. Good night, everyone. Never mind.